Welcome to the August edition of BBRO Beatcast. I'm Francesca Broom, your host and knowledge exchange manager for BBRO. Sugar beet is rarely a priority in August, but with the stop start cereal harvest, you might just find yourself with a little extra time this year to check your crop. So, whilst your first assessment should be for foliar disease, we'd also like to encourage you to think about your varieties and how they have performed. In this month's podcast, we meet with Dr. Simon Bowen and Dr. Georgina Barrett to discuss variety traits. And we hope this will help you to select the right traits for your farm from the 2024 RL. So here we are in the field at Morley. Uh, It's actually a cloudy day, but no rain at the moment. You wouldn't believe the amount of water we have seen this year. And uh, the only thing that seems to be really enjoying it is the sugar beet. So great to see that really progressing, though I'm sure most of you are cursing the, the weather. And what a contrast it is to last year when we had the drought. And I'm pleased to be joined here by Dr. Georgina Barrett. And we're going to just talk a little bit about your previous work, Georgina, because you've been looking at drought, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Most years we get drought at some point in the season, not necessarily very severe. Um, We've had some years where we've had it very early on in the season. We've had issues with establishment and that's caused some challenges later on in the season. Uh, And we've also had it mid-season as well that's seen some canopy loss uh, and some problems going into, into the winter, into harvest. So we've been doing some work looking at how varieties respond to drought, but it's incredibly complex, as I've just alluded to. Um, You've got a lot of different ways plants can respond to drought. So not only is it that initial growth, that survival, that getting that root down and and it being able to access water. It's also that canopy recovery uh, and that response later in the season. And then this can all interact with disease pressure as well. So a lot of your foliar diseases will take hold into plants that are naturally drought stressed. You mentioned there about season so is there a point of the year where it does more damage to the beet crop to have a drought? Yeah so first of all you've got that really early drought um, where if your seeds aren't getting away into moisture you're then going to have plant death and then you're not going to be reaching your 100,000 plants per hectare and then also up to about the end of July any dry period then has a real impact because you're losing your 100% canopy cover and you're not intercepting Uh, the high levels of radiation that you need. Post that period of time, you tend to have enough canopy, enough resilience in the plant for it to recover uh, and to not have too severe a yield loss due to drought. But sugar beet is quite resilient, isn't it? Yeah, we've seen at times where you've had a bad drought and it's on the floor, but the next morning, uh, bright and perky again. Yeah, massively. And that comes back to its maritime ancestry. So it is a naturally resilient plant. It can deal with big changes in water availability. And I think that really highlights as well the importance of keeping that good canopy cover, that nice green and healthy canopy that can go through these periods of transient wilting and actually not have that much detriment to yield of the crop. And actually, we've also, we're joined here with by Dr Simon Bowen and we're, we're looking at variety traits at the moment aren't we so do you want to just talk a little bit about what we're seeing for 2024 what the varieties are we've got and what you think growers should be looking for themselves for this next coming season so what I'd encourage growers to do is rather than think about a variety think about the traits they want to grow and they can use tactically on their land or their different blocks of land. George has talked about, obviously, drought, but this year demonstrates how difficult it is sometimes, you know, and it takes a while before we collect reliable data to do that. But I think, again, look at your own situations and understand and see how crops grow. And whilst the reaction to drought is one thing, but also I sometimes like to think how well they grow in really good conditions, because some grow really quickly and very vigorous and very tall up varieties. Others perhaps a little bit less, particularly if there's another stress there. Complementary to the RL trials, I think it's it's important to appreciate there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, building our understanding science of some of these variety traits. George has talked about drought. There's also work looking at canopy growth habit as well. And George, that's Lucy Tilly's work, isn't it? And you've been looking at some of the results of that and the data we've received. What have you seen? Yeah, it's really interesting. So me and Lucy overlapped for a bit during the end of my PhD and her work was just starting at that point. And it was trying to answer some of those 
sort of theoretical questions that a lot of us have about canopy and sugar beet. So your ideal sugar beet canopy would be one that early in the season is quite flat. It's, it's intercepting a lot of light uh, and it also means it's out competing the weed. So it's getting away, it's covering the ground nice and quickly. However, if we're going to be really idealistic later on in the season, you then want a slightly more upright canopy so that light is making its way through all the different levels of leaves and they're all intercepting light and photosynthesizing. So you're getting more photosynthesis happening per area of leaf cover. Lucy took some varieties that have sort of these different upright, prostrate uh, and also an intermediate canopy type as well. So ones that sit sort of between those two extremes. And she found uh, a lot of what we thought to be true. So that an early flatter canopy is intercepting light more effectively, but in the later part of the season, your intermediate and upright canopies are actually doing better. And that really probably a happy middle ground at the moment with what we understand is that intermediate canopy type that does give that early interception, but also does well later into the season. But it's also important to remember that that interacts with a lot of other things as well, uh, particularly foliar disease and all the other things that we're looking at on the RL list. But it's definitely something I think we need to consider more in the future. Yeah, just go back to the growth habit, though, and just to pick up a point that George actually, yes, the range isn't great, but there is a f effect of sight and season. And I think it's where I'd encourage you as growers to go and have a look, because actually in your situation, particularly on your soil type, you might find it grows slightly differently. We can't get away from it, but there are some genetic differences but actually understanding how they've grown in your situation so actually I think August is a great time to go around particularly the crops not if it's not flat on its back and it's growing quite well because you will see it's kind of natural growth habit and do some very broad assessments and I think from what you've just said it's not just picking a high yield on the 2024 RL and I know that within the beat review article um, coming up in September you've actually produced a nice little checklist for people to use so we need to perhaps get people to, to have a look at that and just think a little bit more carefully about what they're putting in amongst all the varieties as it talks about foliar disease not a, a huge mm. standout but the rating between sort of two and seven isn't it and that is really important and particularly for those growers who perhaps are considering later harvest dates uh, we do have quite a range uh, and we do now collect uh, data from uh, untreated rl trials as well as uh, treated so when i say untreated no fungicide applied and that's beginning to to give us more data because up until now we've been a bit dependent on whether it's a bad disease year or not and you talked about the contrast between 23 and 22 because last year it was 30 40 degrees incredibly dry and we didn't see a lot of disease until much later on until we got the rain this year it's much wetter uh, and, and and temperature and certainly today it feels quite humid so we know that could encourage certain diseases so we might see a little bit more disease this year uh, and actually but using those varieties and understanding how we're going to manage that risk I think is really important we do for the different diseases rust, uh, powdery mildew and cercospora. We do have stratings and of course remember they go on a scale of one to nine, one being very poor so high levels of infection, nine being very uh, resistant, very low levels and I say a lot of the, the, the average points are around six but you will get variation for the different diseases somewhere between two and eight. So it's really worth understanding that and how you might use that, particularly for late harvesting. But again, just understanding the risk. So when you come to uh, think about putting your fungicide program together, you know where your most susceptible varieties are and you can treat them accordingly. You may also know that I have a block of land which can be very wet and it's very sheltered because there's lots of trees, the humidity can be high. That can be a high risk area for foliar disease. So use your local knowledge along with the information on the varieties to make sure you get the best variety on the best bit of land. And this is what I kind of encourage people to do, to be a bit more tactical, tactical with their varieties. On the actual RL list, there's a number of other things. You've talked about foliar disease, but what about bolting? Is this something that you've looked at, George? Yeah, so the uh, recommended list has two scores for bolting on it. It has the values for the early sown bolter trial. So these are trials that go in very early, uh, which we then monitor and we count the level of bolters. Uh, and you'll see a, quite a significant difference uh, in the values you get there. And the real key thing here to take home is the big red cross. If there's a big red cross by a variety, it is not suitable for sowing before mid-March. So when you're looking at disease scores and considering everything else, when you're going back and you're really thinking about when you want to go in and when you want to drill, that is a real key consideration. And also we need to look at sort of the years gone by because sometimes you see the red cross this year and then yeah, you've got the years, two, three years past, there's been an, an issue. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. So when you do look at bolting, bear in mind not every 
winter, early spring is cold. Look at the three year data. I'd also add as well, use your own experience as well, because uh, varieties like BTS 1140, whilst it doesn't have a red cross, the breeders and our experience shows it can produce quite a few bolters and they actually say we would prefer if you didn't do it, if you had other options. So use that experience again, look at the varieties you've got in the ground. Don't think it's been a bad year for bolting in 23, but you never know where you've drilled a little bit earlier. So use that experience as well, guide your own choice. And also, Conviso, do not drill that early. It's an absolute fair point. You know, we sometimes forget to say it, don't we? Because we assume everybody knows it, but the last thing we want is a lot of uh, ALS resistant weed beat uh, causing us a major problem. So we've, we've looked a little bit about the foliar disease, um, and obviously, we also need to look at pests. And I know earlier, George, you did mention something about good establishment of the plant. It's not just drought we need to be wary of. There are a number of pest issues in the soil that we need to be looking at. And one that I know um, your colleague, Dr. Alistair Wright, has been looking at is obviously BCN. You've had the chance to review his papers. What do you think growers need to be doing for um, control of BCM? Yeah, that's a really good point. So testing, testing, testing is a key one. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware that they have a BCN problem. So step number one is identify if you do have an issue with BCN. Uh, there's some fantastic varieties that are coming through now that can compete with the best of the best. So key one, if you've got BCN, you need to be growing a BCN variety, as well as the other work we're doing with drought, uh, with the variety habits, with the scoring we do with disease. Uh, we also look at the claims for BCN that breeders make. So Alistair Wright has developed a protocol that we can use internally in which we grow these varieties uh, and we check how they perform and make sure that they are living up to the claims. And so we've got uh, four varieties of BCN on at the moment and, and now is the time for people to go out and start pulling some roots and just looking because you know July in particular but you know obviously people listen to this in August now is the time to be checking. It is, but the kind of word of caution or advice, when you pull roots to look at BCN, pull them very gently. Because as time goes on, obviously, and as those immature cysts, which are white, mature, they drop off the root a bit earlier. So I often put a spade underneath it and lift it. You can see them. We should still be able to see them. I was looking at some crops last week, so that was the last week of July, and I could see, and I know some of other advisors were seeing white cysts as well, and a little bit concerned how commonly we are seeing them. Bear in mind, it's been a wet year, nematodes cis nematodes and free living nematodes love water and I do wonder if we've seen a bit of a secondary second generation infection this year and I'd love to speak to Alistair about that because the timings of it is about right and the rain some of these crops where there are high levels of BCN are still affected and they're not growing as well as they should be I was in a field last week there was two varieties one non-tolerant one tolerant and it was a night and day difference but we do have four varieties we've got Daphne which we've had for quite a while we've now got Harrietta which is one of the new BCN varieties on the bottom it's really good. We've got Kajana, which we've had for a couple of seasons, and we've also got Button as well now. So we've got four varieties, and I guess I think it's good that we have that choice uh, for growers. But as George says, it's test, test, test. Really need to establish whether you've got a, a BCM problem. And we know for the amount of sales of BCM crops that that it doesn't actually cover what we think there is in the in the area. I mean, it's uh, I think from one of Alice's papers, I remember seeing. 25 to 30 percent of the area could have BCN and I don't think we sell anywhere near that quantity of seed. We don't and I think there's a lot of BCN problems which aren't known about or they're not being managed. Choosing a BCN tolerant variety is important but just remember this about the BCN tolerance not only do those varieties tend to yield a bit better compared to non-tolerant ones in the presence of nematodes there is a level of uh, multiplication which is nematode multiplication which they prevent as well it varies quite considerably but they do tend to suppress the population not sure i call it resistance we tend to use the word partial resistance uh, but it certainly helps suppress the population compared to non-tolerant ones and we all know that managing nematodes is a long-term management problem and unfortunately we can't do any of that through a variety for fln can we no. so the free living nematodes just yeah, ride the water table but um, I know, I mean, we covered this in a previous podcast, but we do have the NEMGARD DE, don't we? We do. And again, talking about some supporting scientific research, there's been some work at Harper Adams again, looking at other ways of controlling free and even nematodes, very early stages, but there's sort of endophyte uh, cover crops and some other crops which may help as well. It's a very difficult and challenging area to research in, but we have had a look at it and there may be some recommendations which come out in the future. Oh, that'd be great. So um, growers need to watch this space and we'll, we'll see what we can do. So let's go back to the varieties then, what we're seeing. So we've covered a little bit about foliar disease. We've covered a little bit about 
the pest, what about yield? So I'm going to say first of all, hats off to all the breeders because we continue the move forward on yields. You know, and we've seen varieties such as BTS1915 come forward and really lay down the challenge, didn't it? It came forward and it was a 7% uplift. But breeders have responded and we see some uh, newer than varieties still performing above the level of the control. So yield is important, but I, my argument is to make sure you uh, deliver that or achieve that yield potential. You need the right traits to almost protect the yield they can produce. Because you have to remember in RL trials, we do give them the very best chance to show their genetic yield. We don't put them under challenges. So you must, mustn't forget that. So you do need to pick the traits which will help protect them. And we've talked about many of them already. A foliar disease, BCN, uh, bolting if you're going early. And increasingly some of the newer ones we're beginning to unpick in terms of the science, such as growth, ha uh, growth habit and drought. And when it comes to sugar content, should growers even look at that as a, a measure? Well, just remember, if you're looking at yield, it's an adjusted yield. So it already has the sugar factor in there. Uh, I think, though, it is worth considering it sometimes, particularly if you are in situations, and you'll know it historically, where you do produce low sugar, sometimes very light droughty soils which struggle to get the canopy. We all know the connections there. So if you are that, and particularly if you're going for an early harvest, back yourself and take a variety with perhaps a slightly higher sugar content because it might help uh, for early harvests. So I suppose that really leaves us with the... The big, um, almost the elephant in the room, although we're not seeing a lot of it for this year, and that is virus. Is that something that growers need to take into consideration when they're looking at the RL? Well, it's challenging, as we know, and I mean, there is so much work going on behind the scenes to look at uh, variety resistance and tolerance. KWS bought first generation of varieties in Marushka, which had some partial tolerance to beat mild. But there's a lot of work going on, but it's really complicated. We've got free viruses. And, you know, just to set the scene a little bit, we're now having to do separate trials with the three viruses, so beet yellows, beet mild and beet chlorosis virus, inoculating varieties separately with each of those viruses to test their genetics. And these are all hand inoculated with infected aphids. So a lot of effort's going into it. It's not easy. And, of course, we'd be very lucky if we find one variety which has resistance against all of those. But I'm very confident there are generations of varieties coming through, and we're working very closely with the breeders on this. We've got Marushka, has a bit of a yield drag with that trait, but there are, the second and third generations are on their way, and we will begin to see varieties with elevated levels of resistance and tolerance. I think to expect we're going to get total resistance and tolerance of virus would be unrealistic and we need to have to learn to do a generally integrated control but I absolutely see variety will be an important part of our integrated control of virus in the future. And you've mentioned the fact that we're doing a lot on virus. I mean, it's, it's more than 25% of our investment. And, and also constantly saying, how can we do this, these trials easier? So we know Alistair's doing a lot of work with drone now, which may actually replace some of the traditional ways of assessing it. If we can build relationships in terms of virus symptoms, we can actually scan our trials and varieties much quicker and use that information. So I think we, we become more effective and more efficient in our way we do our trials as well. And I think it's important for us to mention that we really are supporting the breeders, so we are really efficient. As we've just said, the amount of work that goes into it, we're very well versed uh, with our protocol testing variety. So actually they bring lines through to us for testing, coded lines. We don't know the ins and outs of where they fit in the breeding programme. Um, that's all confidential, but it is helping drive these changes and it will result in varieties being available on farm. So I suppose really I've only got one more challenge for you, Simon, and that is if you had a light, lonely soil and you're going to be looking to harvest end of October, early November, what would be your variety choice? Do you know where I would go first of all? I'd be looking to select a variety of a nice, strong, quite a tall, upright growth habit. But I think the biggest one I'd just steer towards is foliar diseases. I mean, if you remember all the years we ran the BYC competition, and that was very late lifting, time and time again, those varieties which deliver more of those yields are the ones which were more robust with disease. So I would really be looking at a foliar disease score, I think, particularly Sacospa, Rust, and we shouldn't forget powdery mildew as well. I think combining those with a really strong growing uh, growth habit, and I'm still slightly sore of living the legacy of the frost from last year. I want a variety which will give me some protection. Uh, so having that kind of nice vigorous growth habit not only is good for l late light interception, it gives a bit of protection uh, of the plant as well. And what would you say about um, growers spreading their risk and having more than one variety? I think it's important. 
Again, though, uh, think about what traits and how that how we spread that risk. Don't spread it for the sake of spreading it. Think about where those varieties and the traits would probably best fit. It's, it's kind of tactical thinking we haven't had to do before, but I think it's really worthwhile doing it. And I think August is a great time to go and actually assess your own crops and hopefully you all know where your varieties are planted and actually do some very simple assessments, as you mentioned. We can help you with that. Look at your next edition of Beat Review. We have this issue every year, and particularly in the plant clinic, where people know what varieties they've got on field but don't remember where they are. So please do make sure, um, if you didn't mark them this year and you're struggling, then make sure that's done for next year. So thank you both very much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thanks, Chaz. So from one damp day in July, let's look forward to a nice, bright and sunny August and even September. And in September, you can join us at the Beetfield Demo Farm events the 12th of September at Morley and Yaxley and the 14th of September, Bracebridge and Fotheringhay. And this will be your last chance to see the 2024 RL in action in the field. Also, as mentioned in the podcast, look out for your September beat review because that's got a lot of information on varieties. And for those of you that are looking for your basis points, um, we've got a double whammy this month because I've got the July figure, which is CP forward slash 129148 forward slash 2324K. And that's for one point. And August is CP forward slash 129874 forward slash 2324 forward slash K. That just leaves me to wish everyone happy harvest and thank you very much for listening.